know, a lot of uh, good news to tell you about uh, uh, climate change. And uh, based on the uh, introduction, you know, I felt that we should say something positive. I would say it gives us a chance to actually uh, pay more attention to the everyday joys that we have. You know, the nature around you, playing with your grandchildren or having your having a good whiskey or a beer in the evenings. This, uh, it makes us pay more attention to the everyday joys that are all around us in our lives. But uh, we don't have a very, uh, what should I say, positive, happy picture to give you on climate change. But there are some possibilities, there's some scope for improving things and for changing the situation the way it is. How do I change the slides here? Oh, <coughs> If I spoke from there, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we can hear you, but we want to cover you. Thank you. There's a video recording. So. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> no I'm very problem. comfortable can... walking about. And... No, you can have the camera if you want to. Yeah. 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 It's okay. No, no, it's okay. I'm comfortable. Yeah, you can pass it. So, in fact, you know, for the last several years, if you think of the newspaper headlines that you've had, a lot of them have been about different extreme events in various parts of the world. So there were uh, these historic floods in Venice, in Italy. Maybe Chella can do that. Uh, he knows what's coming. And uh, in India, of course, we had the 2018 very heavy rains uh, accompanied by severe flooding <coughs> in Kerala. And in uh, California, for several years now, they've had very bad fires in what is referred to as a fire season, which is actually in traditionally around October, but the season has actually spread. And this last year, the fires were so hot and covered such a wide range that there were in fact more than 1,000 people who were missing. And they had to bring in forensic anthropologists to identify the remains. And in certain parts of Africa, in the Sahel for instance, for several decades they have had a drought. Now the, uh, a number of scientists believe that <coughs> either uh, these kinds of extreme events are being caused directly by climate change or the intensity of these events is actually as a result of global warming that is taking place. And the simple way to understand what climate change or global warming, and they both mean the same thing. The simple way to understand it is to simply think about uh, these things that we refer to, these gases that we refer to as greenhouse gases. And they function like the glass in a greenhouse. And they trap the heat of the sun and they keep it in the atmosphere so that it heats up the atmosphere in the earth. <coughs> these greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrous oxides and some other refrigerants. And we regard carbon dioxide as the most important of these greenhouse gases because it is the one that is most abundant and also some uh, proportion of this actually lasts for thousands of years, exerting its effects. So what does this do? Now this carbon is actually part of a larger carbon cycle that we have all studied in school or we have been <coughs> looking at it in the books of your children and grandchildren. So the, uh, there are certain aspects in the earth system, there are sinks for carbon and then there are sources of carbon. So the sinks are the places where it's absorbed. So the oceans absorb carbon dioxide, all the green cover, plants, trees, crops, all this green cover absorbs carbon dioxide. It's released by respiration of plants and animals, by burning of fuel, fossil fuels and by decay when organic matter decays, carbon dioxide is released. In fact, what we've been saying is that, so there's some kind of equilibrium. So the carbon is uh, absorbed by the things and released by the sources. But since the industrial revolution, what we have done is we have removed this fossil fuel from the earth and we've used it to drive our engines. And when we do that, these, the process of combustion releases these greenhouse gases which have therefore gradually increased carbon dioxide concentration. In fact, the main fossil fuels are coal, oil and gas. And of course, we have, all of us, and some countries more than others, have benefited from this 
uh, economic change that has taken place as a result of burning of fossil fuels. But what has happened is that, next slide, that there has been a steady rise in the carbon dioxide concentration which you can see in the red line and the average surface temperature of the earth, that's the blue line, they have both been uh, steadily increasing. In fact, the current concentrations of carbon dioxide, next slide, are at 410 parts per million in the atmosphere. It is shown by that big blue arrow at the top. Now, if you look at that, the green line that you see is an important one. It is 350 parts per million. And the 350 parts per million is regarded as the safe level below which we should keep carbon dioxide. In fact, if you search on the internet, there is an organization called 350.org. And they have a large global movement on uh, controlling climate change and taking action across the world. So 350 ppm is therefore a very important uh, line. But you know, for 650,000 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide has not crossed that blue line there. Below that, well below that. What we are trying to say is that Homo sapiens or modern humans have never lived in the kinds of carbon dioxide concentrations that we are now experiencing. So this whole thing is something very new for the earth and for our species. The large number of human activities are responsible for the increase in greenhouse gases, the burning of fossil fuels to produce electricity, the millions of cars on earth which are emitting uh, fossil fuels as they are driven, the industrial processes, the fact that they are cutting down trees and uh, deforestation, burning of forests. So that means the, uh, these areas, green cover, that can trap the carbon dioxide are being cut and there's more sources for carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And in fact, the next slide uh, shows you the, uh, before that, the next slide just shows you, oh, I don't have it, fantastic. The, uh, it's just the same thing, you know, because of this, the, you have, uh, different kinds of what uh, the emissions from the greenhouse uh, gases. This is actually showing you something important, and we are not going to get into it more today. But this lays the foundation for what we regard as the ethics of climate change, which is the reason why there are these big fights that you hear about in the newspaper when you are reading about global climate negotiations. What is it? It is that. 350 parts per million, that line that I showed you in the earlier slide, is the safe limit. That means we want to keep greenhouse gas concentrations below that, correct? But much of that space has now been occupied by the rich countries, mostly countries from North America, Europe, uh, Australia and Japan. So they have already occupied more than two-thirds of that space. So there is very little development space that is available for developing countries and for even poorer countries, the least developed countries. Therefore, what it does is it creates an ethical dilemma of insufficient development space. And that is the battle that you read about in different ways when you are reading these news articles in the paper. And there are a range of effects from global warming. And what you find is that primarily what it does, as you can imagine, with more greenhouse gases trapping the heat, there is an increase in temperature. Increase in temperature leads to heat waves. There have been heat waves in different parts of the world which have been directly attributed to climate uh, change. The uh, uh, glaciers, glaciers on land in the North Pole, in the Antarctic, glaciers on mountains, they have, uh, the ice, the glaciers, they are all melting and this leads to an increase in the sea levels. When it's warm, the waters of the oceans expand. So that also increases the sea levels. The, uh, there's been a change in the precipitation, patterns of precipitation because the water cycle is affected. So the monsoons will be very severely affected from climate change. Now these primary changes lead to a whole bunch of other changes. One is of course ocean acidification because the oceans are absorbing carbon dioxide, the, they become more acidic. You must have heard about the bleaching of the corals, uh, Great Barrier Reef, bleaching of other corals. It's all because it's becoming more acidic, meaning the pH is dropping. The uh, forests are beginning to be destroyed because the, at higher temperatures is a problem for different trees. Coastal erosion, very intense storms, coastal flooding takes place. The uh, salt water intrudes into the land. A whole range of problems for coastal communities and infrastructure and investment along the coast. In fact, we have some studies on 
the effects along the coast and what kind of policies are needed. Agriculture is severely affected because uh, crops grow uh, well within, they thrive in very narrow temperature ranges. So if you think about wheat, wheat is very much affected by just 2 degrees warming. And rice is a little more tolerant, but again, little higher than that, rice is affected. Uh, apart from that, since water is also be going to become uh, a problem, both of these combine to make agriculture very productivity and yield very <coughs> Uh, various species are going to be affected because their uh, natural habitats are lost from higher temperatures, reduction in uh, moisture, and a number of diseases that are actually caused by, uh, both carried out, carried by ticks are going to increase because the range where the ticks breed is increasing. In fact, we are now seeing some new diseases which were occur very frequently but are beginning to occur in Karnataka, in that area, around Karnataka. There was a big article about it in the last Saturday's uh, video. Uh, next uh, slide, Chala. The, so there are a whole range of effects, drought, severe uh, uh, floods uh, in Bangladesh, that's a picture there. And in fact, if, you, uh, the, if the glaciers in the Arctic and the Antarctic were to melt, it's, the sea levels would be 120 meters higher. And the picture there simply shows you the a frog that is going extinct in Panama and that's a very thin polar bear because they're not, they need the ice to survive. And uh, so they're not able to survive in these conditions. Next. Uh, in India, there are the same effects that I described are, uh, can be expected in India. In fact, they're taking place and you're probably reading about it. Droughts, storms, landslides, heat waves and effects from sea level rise. And the next uh, picture shows you what we know that we have a very large number of uh, large and medium cities along our coast. In fact, if we have a sea level rise of say uh, 5 meters, up to 80 million people will be uh, affected, they will be vulnerable. In fact, the way this is understood is by thinking about an area referred to as a low elevation coastal zone, which is simply referring to an area along the coast which is up to 10 meters of elevation from the coastline. So if you think of that area, it's a very large number of people who live there. They all become very vulnerable as a result of changes taking place ongoing from the intense storms and future changes from sea level rise. Our neighbor Bangladesh, actually half the country and about half the people live in areas which are extremely vulnerable. So in that red and brown area. So they are extremely vulnerable to uh, effects from sea level rise. And if you look at the next uh, slide, here. yeah. So in uh, the city of Chennai, just to bring it back to where we are, we have actually an elaborate system, drainage system, from in, within the hinterland to the coast. There are a large number of water bodies, tanks, many of them interconnected system of tanks where the water flows from one to another. These help in uh, both uh, protecting from flood, so they protect for flood management and they are also something, uh, it's very useful for agriculture and for other needs. But what has happened is that if you look at the uh, picture from 1980 on the left and 2010 on the right, you find that infrastructure has actually been increasing tremendously. So the red color there is infrastructure. Look at how much it has expanded. And the blue color that you see are the water bodies that you know. You might recognize some of them. And the small ones uh, are also there. But on the right hand side you can barely see them or many of them are missing. Because either you have, we are built up on top of the lake beds or the size of these water bodies has reduced dramatically because of construction. In fact, the next picture shows you that pink color that you can barely see. Hopefully you can see some of it. Shows you how that the areas that were flooded in the 2015 floods that took place. The areas that were flooded actually, if you overlap that on top of the infrastructure, you find all of it is really on this red area where there's a lot of infrastructure. And what is happening here is that the channels for the water to, to go to go to the canals and to the ocean were blocked. The, uh, so there was no way by which the water could drain. And this is a big problem. And this was the reason why we actually had the floods. So one should understand very clearly what's happening in climate change is uh, uh, heavy rains are a meteorological event, but the flooding is not a meteorological event. Flooding is a you know man-made event caused by a whole range of human activities which have led to this. And in fact, in Chennai, the reason for the floods are poor management of waste, uh, drainage, 
encroachment of our uh, canals and <coughs> transportation encroachment on transportation networks which are built on water channels so the water cannot drain and the next uh, section will be covered by Chana. Please excuse me, I have a, a sort of a bad cold, so I may not be able to uh, uh, speak very well. But in this question of what is to be done, climate change is a, is a problem that people have known about for actually more than a hundred years. Uh, the first scientist to talk about it was a person called Arrhenius uh, in the 1890s and he was asking questions like what is going to happen if we keep pumping all these uh, all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and he had an answer uh, which is not too far from what the IPCC has been talking about in the last 20-30 uh, years that is a doubling of carbon dioxide uh, levels above uh, pre-industrial uh, uh, levels would lead to about 4 to 5 degrees of warming. That's roughly what the IPCC is also saying. The IPCC is a climate, uh, scientific climate uh, change uh, body trying to understand uh, the, uh, the science behind climate change, the impacts, uh, what we can do to uh, reduce the effects of climate change and how we can adapt to climate change. But it falls within the ambit of another UN body, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, which itself was founded in 1992 and, and since then every year, like Sudhartha pointed out, there have been these climate meetings to try and discuss, to come up with ways to address the challenge. Next. Now, in uh, 2015 there was a, a climate meeting, it's also called the Conference of Parties or COP uh, for short uh, and this was rather important because uh, this was a meeting where uh, countries of the world came up with their plans for how they were going to go through the next phase of uh, reductions in emissions and also what plans they had to adapt to climate change. And India came up with this report, which was called India's Intended National, uh, Nationally Determined Contributions, INDCs they used to be called, but once they were accepted uh, in Paris, they are now called NDCs. So all these countries have come up with these NDCs and India promised some very ambitious uh, things including uh, a very significant amount of uh, renewables, you would have heard about this. Part of the reason we are pushing solar so aggressively uh, has to do partly with the reduction in costs but also because India made some very stringent uh, commitments to have 100 uh, gigawatts of solar by 2022. Next. Now it turns out that, as uh, uh, Sujata pointed out, uh, <coughs> Agriculture is, is a big part of a contributor to uh, climate change uh, through emissions, through land clearing and think, the activities like that. But it is also uh, going to be impacted by climate change. And uh, it, it turns out that one needs to find alternative ways of doing agriculture, of living in cities, of uh, producing things and so on. And there are some uh, very helpful uh, options that have been that have uh, that have come up this is an example of something called natural farming where uh, uh, it's also called do nothing farming <coughs> so these are forest farms in madhya pradesh uh, where uh, <coughs> there's the yields are actually quite large but, but there's a lot of carbon that is also uh, stored in the soil and in the plants and there's no tilling uh, there's no inputs of uh, fertilizer or uh, uh, pesticides uh, and, and so these kinds of uh, farming methods are becoming very, very significant, very important. The state of Andhra Pradesh recently came up with uh, something called ZBNF, uh, Zero Budget Natural Farming. They are going to try and implement it in all their uh, uh, taluks, uh, have at least pilot farms in all their taluks. So that's, this, is, this, this is a sort of thing that we need to sort of uh, move towards, a kind of transformative change in these issues. Uh, other areas like transportation, Clearly, other countries have some examples that we must pay attention to transforming their cities. So this is from uh, Copenhagen, where there's ample infrastructure made available for bicycles. Uh, bicycles are protected from uh, the main road. There's, uh, there's uh, a lot of attention paid to 
providing non-motorized transport, including pedestrians and bicycles, a lot of uh, space, and that becomes very important. Other cities like uh, Seoul in um, uh, South Korea, uh, they've they've been <coughs> they've taken the trouble to remove infrastructure that existed uh, because not just to beautify the, uh, the river that was flowing through, the drainage canal flowing through, but really to actually provide space for the river, room for the river. Uh, and th these kinds of uh, transformations are conceivable. They do yield uh, positive results for the community and the city as a whole. Uh, but, and they shouldn't, you know, one shouldn't say just because something's already there, you know, we can't change it. That's, that can't be the attitude one takes. Uh, next slide. This is actually Singapore, which is, uh, as you all know, uh, made quite a bit of uh, effort in trying to improve not just the infrastructure, but the landscape and the environment. And here, again, you have lots of room for the river, lots of room for floodplains. And these open areas are also used for recreation. They could be potentially used for other kinds of purposes. If one could think about natural farms in these open areas. And when you have floods, you know, it's okay if those areas get flooded as long as people aren't living there and so on. So, so these are some, some of the kinds of innovative ideas that people are now thinking about at multiple levels. People are also focusing a lot on infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure. And some of this, uh, this is uh, in, the, in Holland and uh, the bottom picture on the right is from, uh, from England, the Thames River, where in order to prepare for storm surges, as you know, both England and Holland are subject to a lot of flooding, uh, even without climate change. And uh, in order to protect themselves in the future, some of these barriers are being strengthened. But these are very, very expensive solutions. They're not necessarily the kinds of solutions that we can adopt for uh, in developing countries like India. And they may not also be feasible. In fact, if we just think about the costs of investment, this is, this is actually a very big challenge. Uh, even to meet our uh, nationally determined contributions, the kind of investment that we need for renewable energy is enormous, runs into the trillions. And uh, you, you see uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a green part and, a, and, a, and a, a red part or an orange part and that has to do with you know, whether one, one is going to take some financing from other countries, some technology transfer from other countries or whether one is going to try to do this on their own. And these are, these are actually very, very tricky issues. And these are parts of, uh, part of the challenges that people face in climate negotiations as well. Questions of finance, questions of who's going to pay for this, and so on. Now, one thing that this, this graph here is important uh, only because it points to us uh, the urgency of what needs to be done. The red line is really showing us how steep our reductions in total carbon emissions, global carbon emissions will have to be. We will have to go to zero uh, carbon emissions uh, before 2050 if we want to have a two-thirds chance of avoiding a two-degree warming. Uh, now this seems like a very tall order and in fact the 1.5 degree report says that it has to be even steeper and we have to go to negative emissions. Uh, after 2050. Now these are all huge challenges that people are still kind of trying to struggle to figure out what what can be done to do this and certainly one can't achieve this through technology alone. Next slide. So we, we so the, 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 the key term that is now coming up is we need transformative change. We can't focus on just technology. We really need to think about how we change our lifestyles, how we change societies, how we rethink or reimagine uh, what the world would look like. And some of the suggestions that have been proposed are to first of all put a price on carbon. Carbon is not a free uh, uh, good. Uh, carbon needs to be taxed, needs to be priced and there needs to be public support for this. There needs to be a reduction or elimination of uh, long distance flying to the extent feasible because a single trip to the United States and back uh, produces about uh, one and a half tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, per person, and that that is that is that is actually about the quota one would have in a year if one starts to start uh, reduce uh, <coughs> one's emission. So these 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 are these are these are issues that start getting into each each of our personal lives. Uh, keeping track of personal carbon emissions, there are lots of uh, online calculators. I would invite you to uh, try and use some of them. 
And in the UK, there have even been plans to actually do this on a community level, to have carbon accounting for everybody and to actually have some kind of a trading scheme so that people can, uh, you know, people who are using less carbon can, can sell some of their permits to others and so on. Uh, certainly, all sorts of com consumption, uh, any uh, consumption is related to uh, has a carbon footprint associated with it. So one needs to pay attention. So carbon calculators are very useful in doing this. There's a lot of interest also in divesting from fuel companies, or fossil fuel companies. Uh, renewables, especially solar, have become so cheap and so uh, attractive uh, that it, one could accelerate the adoption of uh, uh, renewables. If there's less, uh, there's less funding, there's less uh, subsidies, or fossil fuel companies. Fossil fuel companies still get over a trillion dollars of uh, subsidies uh, every year on a global basis. Uh, and then uh, other issues like eating locally, eating mostly vegetarian food, uh, investing in renewables, all of these kinds of issues are also uh, actions that we can all take. I won't uh, repeat myself, but you know we should be walking more, reduce our dependence on, on cars, you know, have simpler weddings, buy fewer clothes, all of those kinds of activities. We don't need to lecture you on all this. Uh, but it's really, uh, you know, that if we want to take climate change seriously, then we really need to think about these things at a very personal level. Uh, of course, apart from what's been happening at the national scale uh, in different countries, the local scale, there's been a lot of action. Uh, so this is uh, the go former governor of uh, California, uh, who held a meeting, to uh, a summit to try and uh, increase awareness and also to increase commitments on reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gases. So, so these kinds of activities at the local level, in, in spite of the kinds of things that uh, Donald Trump has been doing, uh, have been very, very important to keep this momentum going. And certainly there are lots of civil society organizations that are also playing a very important role. Sujata pointed out this uh, group called 350.org and there are many such like them uh, that are doing a lot to try and reduce greenhouse gases. Is this something we should, uh, is there time for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we wanted to show you is uh, <coughs> a, a brief video uh, that shows, you know, just tries to explain what cities look like with sea level rise. Sea level rise is becoming a very, uh, you know, vivid and scary uh, kind of issue. So, take a look. Sea level rise at 2 degrees and 4 degrees. So, it's at 2 